with it here in a second. But let's go ahead and read uh, our theme for 2017 from 1 Corinthians chapter number 9 as they're handing those out. And verse number 19 is where we'll start reading. Paul wrote once again, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews, to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I, made all, I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some." Once again, Paul there is, is expressing the importance of trying to reach every person possible. Trying to uh, find people that are without Christ and doing as what Jesus said to do. Going to the highways and the hedges and compelling them to come to Christ. And so, once again, that's our theme for the year, saving some. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to go ahead and take that, that paper in front of you tonight. Now, I want you to take just a second to think here as I pray in a minute. And I want you to think of a family member that you have that you believe is not saved. And when I get done praying, I want you to write that person's name on that paper. Once again, this is for you. This is not for me or for anyone else necessarily, unless you see fit to share it with someone else in your family that's here tonight. But I want you to write down the family member that God lays on your heart. This could be immediate family. Uh, it could be a, a sibling. It could be a, a parent. It could be a child. Uh, it could be extended family. It could be an aunt, an uncle, a cousin, a grandparent. Uh, someone might say, well, as far as I know, all of my family are saved. Uh, if that's the case, praise God. But I find it hard to believe that there would be too many of us that would fit into that category tonight. I believe probably every one of us has at least one family member without Christ. And so, uh, after I get done praying, I want you to write that name down. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Once again, thank you for your word, which is real. It is true. It is alive. It does speak to us as the Holy Spirit of God who lives inside of us uses it to lead, guide, and direct us and to show us how we ought to live. And Father, I pray that you'd be with our challenge tonight. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to take to heart this theme of not only saving some, but specifically, as we talked about two Sunday nights ago, and as we'll talk about again tonight, saving our families. Father, I pray that you would just speak to our hearts as only you can. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. So go ahead and take just a moment, if you would, and write down the name of that individual that the Lord lays on your heart. And if you want to fold that over so no one sees it, you can. If you want to use that to write down a few notes uh, from the rest of this message tonight to uh, sort of be a, a reminder to you uh, of that individual and trying to reach that individual with the gospel of Jesus Christ, you can. In the meantime, if you've already written that name down, I want you to turn over to the book of Genesis again. Genesis chapter number 14 tonight is where we're going to look. We're going to look at two stories here, real briefly, involving the same individual. Now, two Sunday nights ago, we looked to the book of Genesis and specifically looked at the life of Noah, uh, that great man of God who was used by God to build the ark, and ultimately to save himself, his wife, his three sons, and their wives from the flood, and, and really to save the human race because of the faith that he had in God. And we talked about his three sons. And we talked about his three daughters-in-law and how that they had to make a decision themselves to believe. Even his wife had to make a decision to believe that God did not save the other seven people that got on that ark because of Noah's faith, he saved them because of their own faith. And that God does not save a, a household because one person gets saved, and so then everyone in that house is protected. No, every person in that house has to make a personal decision to receive Jesus Christ as Savior. And so, because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and He does not change, we know that in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, that when Shem, Ham, and Japheth got on the ark, 
with their father and mother and their wives, they had to personally make that decision ahead of time. Hey, we believe God. Our faith is in God. And we talked about saving our families. And I told you that this year, as our theme is saving some and reaching people around our community and around the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ, probably the best place for us to start is in our own family. Because the people in our family, we know better than those outside our family in most cases. In most cases. We know the testimonies of our family members as far as whether they know Christ or not, and whether they're a, a believer in the Word of God or not, uh, where they stand on so many things. And so that's probably the best place for us to start. When you go door knocking, as we do on Saturdays, and you talk to people at their door, uh, you try to find out in as brief amount of time as possible what they believe and where they're at spiritually. And that's not always an easy thing. Because depending on what they've grown up being taught and what churches they've uh, been in, they, you could go on a bunch of rabbit trails before you actually are able to figure out what they believe about the Word of God, what they believe about God Himself, what they believe about the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And so your family is probably that ground on which every one of us could start right now, could start immediately to plant the seed and to try to uh, work on them uh, to get saved. Now, with that in mind, I want us to look at another patriarch of the nation of Israel, and that's Abraham. And in the two stories we're going to look at tonight, we're going to see how that Abraham, and at one time he was known by the name of Abram, we know that, a shorter uh, a version of the name, uh, that Abraham was used by God twice to save or to deliver his nephew, Lot. Now, the Bible tells us that Lot was a righteous man. So, in the stories tonight, we're going to be seeing how that God, uh, through Abraham, uh, was able to work, and how that Abraham was able to influence an already saved family member, or someone who was all, already had the knowledge of God, but that went wayward from God. So looking there at Genesis chapter number 14, nonetheless, the, the, the points that I'll be uh, giving to you, they're applicable to lost or saved. All right, Genesis chapter number 14. And let's just see the setting for this first story real quickly. And we won't read it all for sake of time. It says, And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elisar, Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shanab, king of Adma, and Shemeber, uh, king of Zeboam, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. All these were joined together in the vale of Siddim, which is the Salt Sea. So the Bible tells us that there is a battle that takes place between four kings and their, their armies, and five kings and their armies. Now, at this point in time, Lot, Abraham's nephew, is living in the city known as Sodom. And he is or living near the city known as Sodom. He has pitched his tent towards Sodom after his, his uh, substance had uh, been blessed and multiplied by God. And his uncle's substance had been blessed and multiplied by God. And they realized that the land could not contain both of their families and, and both of the riches that they had. And so they separated. And remember, Abraham being older and wiser, he took the higher route. And he said, Lot, my nephew, you decide which direction you want to go. And whatever direction you go, I'll go the opposite way. And Lot lifted up his eyes and he saw the uh, well watered plains uh, there of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he went that direction, and Abraham went the opposite direction. And so he had pitched his, his tent directed towards Sodom. Sodom was a wicked city, as we know. Sodom and Gomorrah were both wicked cities. But he had pitched his tent towards Sodom, and over time he got closer and closer to Sodom. And as I said, this is a picture of someone who's already born again, who goes wayward from their faith. But the principles still are applicable to someone that's lost, the family member that you, uh, whose name you wrote down on your paper tonight. 
So with that said, here is Lot over here, his tent pitched towards Sodom and the king of Sodom, as well as four other kings, decide they're not going to serve this other king that reigns over them or these other four kings that are bigger and more powerful, whose nations are stronger. And so they rebel and a battle incurs and ultimately the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Bela, which is also called uh, Zoar, the king of Zeboam, and the king of uh, Adma, all five of these kings uh, uh, lose the battle. And what happens is the four stronger kings come, and they come into the land there, and they take the, uh, uh, the substance of Sodom and Gomorrah and these other cities, and they take Lot and his family. Now, the Bible tells us about this here. In uh, verse number uh, eleven, verses eleven and twelve, and they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, and all their victuals, and went their way. And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods, and departed. Now, verse number thirteen, we're going to read about Abram or Abraham and his part in delivering Lot. It says, "And there came one that had escaped, and told Abram the Hebrew." For he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eschol and brother of Aner, and these were confederate with Abram. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night, and smote them and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. So the Bible tells us that when Abram got word that Lot had been taken, he immediately got his servants together and they went out along with these other two men, uh, uh, Mamre uh, and Eskel and Aner. And they, they go out and they fight against these uh, these kings, and they ultimately defeat them and bring back Lot and bring back uh, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah and bring back all that had been plundered from those two cities. Notice what happens. We're going to skip a few verses here, but notice what happens here in uh, verse number 21. It says, And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich. Save only that which the young men have eaten and the portion of the men which went with me, Aner, Eskel, and Mamre. Let them take their portion. So they come back, and the part that we skipped is where they actually give a tithe, or Abram gives a tithe to this uh, priest of God by the name of Melchizedek. But they come back, they meet up with Melchizedek, and then they meet up with the king of Sodom. And the king of Sodom says, you know what, you can keep all of the goods, I just want the people. By the way, that's very telling about how Satan is. Yeah. Satan will say, go ahead and have everything, I just want the people. By the way, tonight, that's exactly what Satan, the deal that Satan is trying to offer to Christians and that he's trying to offer to Christianity. Go ahead and have everything of the world. Just let me keep the people. That's all I want is their souls. And Abram tells him, you know what? I don't want any of the goods. I didn't go after these people because I wanted some kind of a payment. I went after these people because of the people or for the people's sake. For Lot's sake, for his wife, his children, for their sake. And he says, not only that, I don't want anything from you because I don't want you to say that you're the one who made me rich. If I become wealthy, if I become rich, it's going to be because God blessed me. That's another uh, uh, thought that we can take with us tonight is that we need to make sure that we don't take of the filthy lucre of the world and ultimately allow Satan to buy us off as this king of Sodom tried to do with Abram. But I want to point out first to you, I only have two points really for you tonight, but I want to point out first to you from this story that the reason that Abram's family was saved 
was because he was personally invested in their salvation. He was personally invested in their salvation. Someone says, Preacher, what do you mean that he was personally invested? Well, the Bible says that when that one person came to him in verse number 13 and told him what had happened, that he immediately got together the forces that were necessary in order to go after Lot. And may I say to you tonight that Abraham, in this situation, he did not react off of emotion. Though the Bible does not tell us about a time of prayer that he had with God, the Bible does tell us about a promise that he made to God. That promise that he made to God was, Lord, I'm not going to take anything as far as a, 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 a reward if you allow me to come back with my family and with the people of Sodom and Gomorrah and all the goods from there, if you allow me to have the victory along with these three men that are going out with me and my servants. So he did have peace from God that he was supposed to go. No doubt he prayed about it, he got peace about it, and he went and he made a promise to God. And so therefore he, he, uh, he gathered the, the forces necessary and he invested personally in this endeavor. He invested in three ways. With his servants, with his supplies, and with himself. The Bible tells us here in verse number 14 that when he heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. He made sure he got all of his servants, 318 of them, and he armed them with supplies with weapons, with swords, and they went out. He didn't just send them out, but he went out with them. So ultimately, he used everything at his disposal to make sure that his loved one, Lot, and Lot's family were saved. That's the first thing we need to remember tonight, is the person whose name you wrote on that paper tonight, They'll only be saved or only be reached with the gospel if you are personally invested in their salvation. That means anything that you have as a resource, using it to reach them for the cause of Christ. The greatest thing that you have as a resource is time. And yet it's the thing that we invest the least in as far as the salvation of our family and friends. Salvation of souls. If we want our family members to be saved, if you want that person whose name you wrote on that paper to be saved, you are going to have to personally invest in their salvation. You're going to have to use your time, your talent, and your treasure in order to plant the seed. The second thing that we can see is found later on in Genesis chapter number 18. Turn over there, another story that we're familiar with, with Abraham as we see here in, in Genesis chapter number 18, he is called Abraham and involving Lot. The Bible tells us that God comes to Abraham and he, there are two angels with him. And Abraham does not recognize him as the Lord per se, but recognizes him as a guest. And so invites him and the two angels to sit down and to eat and uh, Sarah makes something for him, and then the Lord tells Abraham that Sarah is going to have a child, and, and, uh, and Sarah overhears it, and she laughs about it, and he asks her why she laughed, and she says, I didn't laugh. And we go through that whole story, and at the end, in verse number 16, these men get up to go on their way. It says, And the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. So the Lord with these two angels are getting ready to leave, and the Lord decides to tell Abraham about something that's going to happen, about some judgment that's going to come to pass here shortly. The Bible tells us here in verse 20, And the Lord said, 
Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me. And if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. So the Bible tells us that God reveals to him that Sodom and Gomorrah is going to be judged because of their wickedness, because of their sin. And after revealing this to him, the two angels are sent on their way. In, in Genesis chapter number 19, we read about that story and about the angels coming to warn Lot to get him and his family out of Sodom and Gomorrah. But in Genesis chapter number 18, from verse 23 to verse 33, we now have a conversation between Abraham and God. And notice in verse 22 that the very last phrase is this, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. The second thing that we can see tonight, the first thing from the first story is that if you want that person to be saved, you're going to have to be personally involved. The second thing is you're going to have to be prayerfully involved or invested. Prayerfully invested in their salvation. As we see here that Abraham has this conversation with God and we know the conversation he says, Lord, if there are 50 righteous in that city, will you also uh, destroy the righteous with the wicked? And God says, no, of course not. And then he says, OK, well, will you do if there's 45 righteous? And he says, no. And then, of course, remember, the number keeps going down to 40 to 30 to 20 and then finally on 10. And we've talked about this before here at our church. We know why he, he stopped at the number 10, because ultimately, if Lot, who was righteous, who, who did know the Lord, had reached the rest of his family, his children alone, then at least 10 people in the city of Sodom would have been righteous and God would have spared the whole city. Nonetheless, uh, Lot was as one who mocked, the Bible says, that Lot was a hypocrite. And so when his children looked at him, his sons and his married daughters, they looked at him and his sons-in-law, they thought, what do you mean to tell us or to preach to us about God who's going to bring judgment because of sin? You've been living here in Sodom all this time. And now you're going to tell us about God bringing judgment. And so they did not believe. And ultimately, Lot is uh, pulled out of the city with his wife and his two daughters. And we know how that story ends, very sadly. But nonetheless, Lot is saved. One thing I, I would mention to you tonight about that story concerning Lot, the Bible tells us that Lot was told to go to the mountains but he said, well, wait a second, there's a city right over here. I don't know if you've ever known what, or, or recognized this, the name of that city that he mentions, but it, it says that the name of that city in verse number 22 of Genesis 19 is the city of Zoar. Now that name should sound familiar because in Genesis chapter number uh, uh, 15, where we just read a few moments ago, one of the cities that was in league with Sodom and Gomorrah in that battle was the city of Zoar. God said, I want you to go to the mountains. And Lot says, oh, but that's too far. How about over here to Zoar? And God says, fine, you go to Zoar. But I cannot destroy Sodom and Gomorrah until you are inside the gates of the city. And it's once they get to the city of Zoar that his wife looks back. And she is turned into a pillar of salt. Now, I want you to think for a moment, why would God want them to go all the way to the mountains when they were perfectly safe inside the city of Zoar from that over, uh, or from that, that judgment of God and from the overflow of that hellfire and brimstone that rained down upon those two cities. Well, I believe it's because if he had gone to the mountains, his wife may not have had the opportunity to look back. If you think about it, when you get into the mountains, any of us that have driven through the mountains, you get into the mountains, it's a lot harder to see the valley. And to see the plains. But when you're in the plains, you can see for miles. And so, yes, they stayed in the plains, but God had originally wanted them to go into the mountains. And so even the hand of God, the grace of God, was evident at that point, but they chose to ignore the grace of God. They were still, Lot and his two daughters were saved. And the Bible tells us that they were saved. If you uh, turn over just for a second there to uh, Genesis chapter number 19. Because of Abraham. In verse 27 it says, And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. 
And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld. And lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in the, in the which Lot dwelt. Now, Abraham had had this conversation with God. And even though there weren't ten righteous, and God was not going to salvage those two cities, He was going to bring judgment, God did remember Abraham when it came to Lot. And Lot was spared, and Lot was saved. And so was his wife, but she chose to look back. They were saved because of Abraham. Now, what is it in Abraham's prayer or his conversation to God that, that we see in Genesis chapter number 18 can, can we draw from it to apply to ourselves? Well, two things real quickly. We see that his prayer had purpose. What was the purpose of his prayer? It was the salvation of his nephew, who was already saved, but also the salvation of his nephew's family. When we pray to God for our families, we need to be specific. We need to have a purpose. You may love that individual whose name you wrote down on that piece of paper. You may think the greatest of them. But let's be honest, when we're talking to God, we're not trying to be politically correct. If you think they're lost, then you need to pray and ask God to save them. God knows their heart. So pray specifically. Pray with a purpose. Lord, I'll be honest. I don't think they're saved. Lord, would you, would you reach down from heaven and speak to their heart? Lord, they're doing some things in their life that just aren't right. When you're talking to God, it's not gossip. When you're talking to God, it's supplication. It's prayer. Take that prayer to God and pray with a purpose. Sometimes when we pray for these individuals that we love, whose names we may have written down on these papers tonight, we pray very generically, Lord, bless so-and-so. Well, do you really want so-and-so to be blessed? Because if they're blessed, they may never turn to God. I have family members tonight who are blessed financially, but they don't know God at all. So should I be praying for them to be blessed, or should I be praying for them to be saved? Big difference. We need to pray with a purpose. Now, I'm not saying pray that God's judgment comes down upon them, but God knows how to draw them to Him better than I know how to draw them to Him. And we need to pray with a purpose. Lord, I don't know their heart, but I don't believe they're saved. And if they're saved, Lord, could you, could you show me? Could you uh, give me an opportunity to talk to them? Could they maybe share with me their personal testimony so that I have peace about their salvation? Pray with a purpose. The second thing that we see about his conversation with God that could help us in our prayer lives is that he was persistent. He was persistent. Notice how, once again, he started at 50 people. And he was very gracious in his conversation with the Lord because he knew at this point who he was talking to. When God came with those two angels to his tent at first, he did not realize who was coming to his tent. But by the time they, those two angels were sent to Sodom uh, to get Lot and to warn Lot and his family, he knew who he was talking to. And so he was very gracious. We have no right to demand anything of God because he's God. But we can still be persistent with our prayer requests persistently taking them to God. We talked about this this morning in the Sunday School Hour with the men. I told uh, the men that so often people stop praying to God because they take their prayer request to God and they don't get it answered the way they expect it to be answered. Or because God takes something out of their life or takes someone out of their life. And that makes them upset. Can I say to you once again tonight... I, I'm not being judgmental of you if you have lost someone or if you have lost something because I've never lost a spouse. I've never lost a child. I've never lost a, a parent. But God knows what's best. God always knows what's best. I don't, you don't, but He does. And if He took something from you or took someone from you, it's for a reason. It was to draw you closer to Him. It was to make you stronger in your faith in Him. And if God tells us no in an area, that's not a good enough reason to stop praying. As I told the men this morning, my kids come to me all the time and ask me for things, and I tell them no sometimes. 
And I mentioned to them how that right now, Timothy, he loves to look at Legos on the phone. And he wants me to look up Legos. And he says, Daddy, can you look up uh, uh, Lego football guys, Lego football mascots? And I'll say, no, Tim, I don't have time right now. Okay, okay, okay. And he'll come back 10 minutes later. Dad, can you look up Lego football mascots on your phone? Tim, I don't really have time. Okay, okay. And he'll come back about 20 minutes later. Dad, can you? I'm glad that he doesn't stop asking. I'm glad that he doesn't think that just because I say no, that it's not right right now, that he doesn't just say, well, I'm just not going to ask my dad for anything ever again. Because that's how some people are with prayer. They say, well, I asked God for this and he didn't, he didn't give it to me. So, he knows what's best. There's a reason why he doesn't give it to us. Keep praying to him. Keep going to him. Keep being persistent in your prayers. Your family member may not get saved tomorrow, and they may not get saved next Sunday, and they may not even get saved this year. But if you keep praying and praying and praying, you never know, they might get saved next year. He says, Lord, if there's 50, would you save the city? But before the chapter's done, he says, Lord, if there's just 10. He was persistent. Remember the story that Jesus told in the book of Luke about the woman who had lost her husband? And she said, to, she went to the judge in her city and said, hey, these, uh, these creditors or these debt collectors, they're coming after me. And she says, well, you avenge me of mine adversaries. And he didn't care for her one bit. And he didn't care for God at all. He didn't have a fear for God. And he was, didn't want to answer her request. And so he ignored her and she came back. And he ignored her and she came back and came back and came back and came back. And finally he said, listen, you keep bothering me about it, fine. Here you go. I'll take care of this problem for you. And Jesus said, if an unrighteous individual like that judge would do that for that woman, what will God do for us if we'll just be persistent in our prayers? Fervent, persevering in our prayers. If you want that person whose name you wrote on that paper tonight to be saved, you're going to have to be prayerfully invested. That doesn't mean that we just pray for them tonight and we go home and we don't think about them all week and then we come back next Sunday and, oh, God speaks to our heart. Oh, I need to pray for that person again. No, that means praying for them today, tonight, before we leave. Praying for them tomorrow. Praying for them Tuesday. Praying for them Wednesday. Praying for them daily until they get saved. And the reason I wanted you to write that person's name down, whoever it was that God spoke to you about tonight, was because that person could get saved. If you, not your spouse, not your children, not your sister or brother or parents, but if you get personally involved and prayerfully involved in their salvation. Father, thank you.